Um, hi there. Um, my name is Anna Poole. I'm working at Oklahomans for Quality. I'm the technical coordinator. Um, my pronouns are they, them. And thank you all for coming to tonight's panel on human trafficking, sexual violence, and the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I know from experience that it's very hard as an LGBTQ plus person um, to uh, talk about sexual assault, to talk about sex crimes. And I wanted to do this panel after meeting with Kenneth Elmore and Brian Wilson um, from the district attorney's office and Tulsa PD respectively. Um, I, I realized that there are times in my life where I should have reported something and I didn't. So I wanted to take this opportunity to share some of the things that they taught me um, about what that process looks like with members of our community. Um, because there's a lot of social stigma um, with reporting sexual assault um, that our community faces. And I want to try to bridge that gap between law enforcement, between DIVIS, um, and our community. So tonight we're going to hear from uh, members of the Tulsa Police Department, um, from, a, from a prosecutor as part of the Special Victims Unit, and from two great individuals um, who work for Dis DIVIS. So um, I'm so thankful that you all came today. Um, so thankful to have you all here. Um, and we're just going to get right on started. Um, so first up, we're going to talk to Brian Wilson, Lieutenant Brian Wilson, um, part of the Human Trafficking and Vice Unit for Tulsa Police Department. So, hey, Brian. All right, hello, everybody. Hopefully, uh, I'm going with this. I'm not very technologically savvy, so I'm going to do my best. Uh, yeah, as Anna said, I'm Lieutenant Brian Wilson. My pronouns are he, him. Um, and I'm the Lieutenant of our Human Trafficking Vice Unit here in Tulsa. Um, probably a lot of misconceptions about our unit and exactly what it is that we do. Uh, we are an undercover unit that focuses on human trafficking and vice related crimes. So human trafficking, it's many forms. We're talking sex trafficking, child sex trafficking, commercial sex trafficking, and labor trafficking. It comes in many different forms. Uh, it never looks the same. Um, and it's very, very difficult for our victims and for the families that are involved in it. Um, along with that, our vice related side, we work um, gambling, alcohol, narcotics, basically anything people think of when they think of traditional vice, we work those things as well. Um, we take a very victim centered approach uh, to all of our operations and all of our cases. Uh, the most important person that we deal with is our victim. Uh, and when we come in contact with them, the first thing we try to do, even before we begin the bulk of the investigation, is to plug them into services. Uh, we work with many, many groups. Some, some people are here tonight to speak to you guys, you folks. Um, and we get people services. We want them to get help first, because really, when it comes to human trafficking, the recovery has to start at the same time the investigation does. Um, otherwise, we're never going to get a successful resolution and we're never going to get true justice for our victims. Um, so let me see. I had my notes here and I just lost it. Um, sorry, and I just said I'm not technically savvy. Here we go. All right. So what could a person uh, who's experiencing violence, um, how, you know, how could they come to us for help? Well, there's many different ways that you can do it. Uh, if you're in dealing with trauma right at the moment, mm -hmm. you can call 911. Uh, and when the officer shows up and you speak to them and you tell them what's going on, they should have the training and they should know that they should call me. Uh, and then we will come out and we will begin to process and work your case. You can report that you're uh, being a victim to the hospital. Maybe you're at the hospital. You could report it to your therapist. You could report it to your counselor. You could report it to somebody at the Equality Center that you are dealing with uh, a trauma in your life and it's related to human trafficking in some way, shape, or form. They have my number. They have my cell phone number. They will call me and we will begin trying to seek justice for you. Um, so kind of how does the whole process look? Um, we, we went from, I think, two human trafficking arrests in the city of Tulsa in 2018. And the next year, we went up to 22 arrests for human trafficking. Um, our cases, and I'm going to let uh, Kenneth Elmore, our district attorney that we work with, and I know that Lieutenant Aaron Rich works with, speak more about that side. But our cases go to prosecution on the state side and on the federal side, depending on which place suits it best. 
But when we come in contact with a victim, again, the first thing we try to do, really the three questions we ask when we come in contact with a victim is, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? And do you have a safe place to stay? Because really those are the needs that we need to try to get met right away for them before we even start to worry about the investigation. Um, once we get plugged into the situation, so after you contact your counselor or the police officer or the hospital, the equality center, and we get involved, our first step is going to be an interview. And it's a pretty informal interview. You can see how I'm dressed right now. This is how uh, either me or my investigators will be dressed. And we're gonna have a conversation. Many of those conversations occur with your counselor present. Most of the time they won't, but if that's really important to you, they can. Uh, we have a conversation. We try to figure out exactly what's going on with you and then figure out how we can address it. I know Lieutenant Aaron Rich and I work close together. Some of our cases cross paths. And if you come in contact with me and it's really his realm, um, it's an easy handoff and an easy transition to his side. Um, Let's see, what, what does help look like for us? Help for us is, so we, we have a saying that a, a safe victim is a win. So a win for us isn't a uh, necessarily a successful prosecution. It's not making a case. It's definitely not making the news because you don't see us on the news. Um, it is a safe victim. That's what we're looking for is, is safety for them. Uh, and then who, who would you guys talk to? Um, you would talk to me or you would talk to one of my investigators. You would also hopefully decide to talk to one of our service providers that can provide you with whatever form of help it is that you need because we, we try to have as many as we can to fit all the needs of the, of the people that we deal with. Um, I'm, I, 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 could, I could say a lot and I could go on a lot and I know I can answer questions. Anna, is there anything else that, that, that I missed about our group that you want me to talk about? Ryan, that was really great. I liked when you said that a safe victim is a win. Um, I liked when you said um, that, that like how, who you're gonna interact with, that you have that interview with a plainclothes plain officer. That's really cool to me. Um, I'm very scared to talk to cops. I've had a bad interaction with cops. And so it's cool to think that it's just somebody like you in a t-shirt and jeans, um, that I could have a counselor there, um, that I could, I could be safe and feel safe talking to someone about that. So I'm, re I'm really glad you brought up those points. Um, I don't have any questions for you right now, but maybe later. Um, thank you, Brian. Do you have anything else? No, I'm not right now. After hearing some of these other folks who speak better, I probably will. Thanks. <laughs> well, um, Brian actually is, uh, Brian and Kenneth are who I met, and the reason I wanted to do this panel um, because it, it was one of my first interactions with law enforcement that I did feel safe. Um, and since then I've got to meet Darren and talk with him a bit. And I think he's another really great, um, member of this community that could, that could help people. And Darren, so next we're going to hear from Lieutenant Darren Aaron Rich. And he is, um, a Lieutenant on, um, part of Tulsa Police Department's Special Victims Unit. Dun, dun. Um, so Darren, I keep doing that. I feel like the joke has gotten really old for them, but it won't ever be old for me. So, uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Darren Aaron Rich, please take it away. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, thank you, Anna, for having us. My name is Lieutenant Darren Aaron Rich. Uh, I utilize he, him pronouns. And like Anna said, I'm the head of the Tulsa Police Department Special Victims Unit. And what we do is we handle all sexually motivated crimes against victims that are 14 and older. And that could be rape, sexual assault, forcible sodomy, sexual battery. Um, if someone commits an indecent exposure, um, if someone breaks into your house and steals all your underwear, that's going to be a sexually motivated burglary. And our, our unit will investigate that. So if there's a sexual motivation to the crime and the victim is 14 years or older, then that case is going to come to us outside of homicide. Um, so that's what we do. And generally, uh, for Tulsa, we handle roughly uh, We've averaged about a thousand cases a year um, over the last five or six years, <clears throat> with about roughly 500 to 550 of those being forcible rapes. And the other broken down between sexual battery, that could be someone groping you against your will, like if, if you're walking by and someone just grabs your butt or grabs your breasts, if you're a female, 
um, that would be considered a sexual battery, um, indecent exposure. So that's a general the breakdown of our kids. Um, the SVU has myself, I run it. I've got a second in command, Sergeant Dean Heidi. Uh, he is an excellent investigator and a, you know, just a phenomenal uh, person that helps me administer this unit. And we have five detectives. Uh, we are all just phenomenal investigators. And we also partner heavily with DVIS, who you'll hear from later. Uh, we uh, partner with the same program. And we have an advocate that is assigned specifically to our unit that helps us with uh, the emotional trauma of the victims processing the inevitable emotional trauma that comes from a result of these crimes. Being a police officer for 13 years, um, I've consistently said that I believe that sexual assault is the most traumatic crime that you will survive. Uh, someone can steal your car, someone can break into your house and steal your belongings. Um, but when you're sexually assaulted, they're just a part of you that you can't get back. So we've got a, uh, a great victim advocate up here that helps us and helps victims um, deal with that, the processing of that trauma um, when we come up here and talk to us. So I, I'd kind of like, I know that there's a lot of reluctance to talking to police. Um, there's, there's people in certain communities that feel that the reports won't be taken seriously. So I kind of like to tell a couple of just anecdotes real quick to kind of express um, how passionate we are about our work. Um, I took over this unit in September of 2020. And um, later that month, we had a very serious sexual assault that involved a prostitute. She was at Quick Trip and made an arrangement uh, to, to perform some sexual acts on just whatever random customer it was. She had no idea who it was. And he took her to a park and began asking for things that she wasn't comfortable with. And at that point, she just said that no, she wanted to cut that off. And she just told us that she got a very, very uneasy feeling um, and tried to get out of the vehicle. And that suspect came around, um, brutally assaulted her, um, and then forcefully raped her and left her on the side of the road crawling for help. Uh, luckily, um, she didn't have a phone with her, but a patrol officer happened to patrol through that area approximately 10 to 15 minutes later after that assault and just saw her crawling for help and was able to get her um, to a hospital immediately where she was, uh, where a saint exam was performed. We'll, we'll talk about those later. Uh, but that case came to us and, you know, we, we did not care that she was a sex worker. That paid absolutely no, had no factor whatsoever in the investigation. Um, it, was, it, it was a rape. We worked furiously to identify this person, and within a week, we had him identified and arrested. And you know, Mr. Elmore, who you'll hear from later, is currently prosecuting that crime. Um, we have another case we're prosecuting right now, where we had a mother and daughter who immigrated here from, I believe it was Venezuela or you know another South American country. Um, knew some other immigrants here and got hooked up with this family where they could stay there, and they made an arrangement that. They would stay with this family and clean their house to kind of um, pay that arrangement for safe housing here in the States. And uh, the, the male that owned that house, um, he began attempting to set up cameras in the room they were staying in. Um, it was a mother daughter. He began recording the daughter in the shower. Um, and when they found this stuff out, they moved out immediately. He started stalking them and we got him arrested and charged with the account of indecent exposure. Um, for sending a lewd photograph to the mother. Um, but I'm charged with obscene material for recording the daughter in the shower and two counts of stalking. Um, after his arrest, his uh, stalking on these undocumented immigrants increased. Uh, he was going to their work. He was going to their home. He was destroying their cars on a near daily basis. Uh, the lead detective got him put on a GPS monitor, which didn't slow him down one bit just continued to perform those activities, continued to stalk them, continued to harass them, continued to show with their work, continued to vandalize their vehicles. And we got him arrested on additional counts and the detective <clears throat> rallied incredibly hard for him to be held without bond. And this is in you know, a late middle-aged male with no criminal history that the detective worked furiously hard for to make sure that this suspect who was harassing undocumented immigrants was held without bail. Again, I, I, I tell these, you know, anecdotes to just show that ultimately um, what I hope that these examples show is that regardless of whether you're gay, lesbian, transgender, uh, you work in the sex environment, um, that those things mean absolutely nothing to us when we're investigating these crimes. Uh, we see you as a victim and our role is to make sure that we are assisting you as best possible in getting justice in your case to the best of our ability. 
So, and statistics tend to show that, uh, when it, especially when it comes to you know, sexual assault, we're passionate about it because these aren't one-off crimes. If, if you've been sexually assaulted by someone, this, the overwhelming statistics show that that person has sexually assaulted someone else. And so every time that we can get someone off the streets from one of these crimes, it just contributes to the overall safety of our community. So if you are the victim of a sexual assault, how does getting, what, what does getting help look like? And like Brian, like Lieutenant Wilson said, um, that can start with talking to your counselor or talking to a trusted friend. Um, and ultimately, uh, every adult victim has to determine whether or not they want police involved. And that's, that's, that can always be a very personal choice because if you are a victim of sexual assault, there's, you're on an order of sometimes 10 times more likely to be sexually assaulted by someone you know. And that can be a very personal and very difficult choice to go forward with a criminal prosecution on someone that's probably been close to you for no telling how long. And everyone has to make that choice of what's best for them. And ultimately, I just want victims to know that we are here to support them, whether or not they decide to get police involved. So, if you are a victim of sexual assault, what does it look like? If you do want police involvement, then generally you would call 911 and your first contact would be with a patrol officer who will take the original reports. Um, we'll take a statement from you, just a very basic kind of who, what, when, where, why statement. They won't really go into great detail because you'll, you'll meet with the detective at a later time to kind of go into a more, more informalized, but a, but a deeper uh, interview about the greater circumstances around your assault. Um, and, that patrol officer, again, will take a report, try and set you up with services if needed. If you're in a position where um, your uh, assailant is in the house, they'll try and get you with safe housing, uh, try and get you hooked up with DVIS for any kind of trauma support that you may need. Um, and if you're within the, um, the time frame for a SANE exam, um, to offer you a SANE exam if you want. And again, a, a, an advocate for DVIS will go into what, what that process looks like later, but that will be an option. And then once all those things are completed, uh, the initial response by patrol is, is handled. Then that case comes up to our unit um, for the more broad investigation uh, into those circumstances. And we'll, we'll hunt down any, any additional information we can, whether that's through search warrants, um, talking to any additional witnesses, uh, just anything we can to generate information and put together a strongest case possible to put over to uh, Assistant District Attorney's Office and Mr. Elder. Um, and if you decide that you don't want police involvement, but you are a victim of sexual assault, there is always the option to get a SANE exam without a police report. Um, like I said, these are very, very traumatic events. Uh, there is, there's a lot of emotional processing that every victim has to go through. And that, that decision of whether to have a police involvement, it, it's not easy. And sometimes it takes victims a lot of time to determine whether or not they want to do that. Um, but still, as a victim of sexual assault, you have the right to have any kind of forensic evidence preserved, whether or not you want police involvement. Where in the future, if you decide that you want to come forward in the future, you'll have that forensic evidence preserved at the time. And um, if you are a victim of sexual assault and get a non-report SANE exam, your report will be stored by number only until such time as you feel that you are ready to come forward. And again, with the trauma of these cases, sometimes it takes have child sexual abuse victims that aren't, they don't have the courage to come forward until their 40s. And that's okay because for every sexual assault victim, there's, there's no right reaction to it. And there's no right way to handle the trauma that you're going through. So you always have that option to preserve physical evidence until such time as you're ready to go forward with an investigation because you know, the, the process of an investigation can be intimidating. Uh, the process of testifying in court can be intimidating, and Mr. Elmore will speak to you know, those factors a little bit later. But again, ultimately, as investigators, our only goal and our only aim is to, is to assist you um, as a victim of sexual assault, make sure that you are safe in housing, um, that we are hooking you up with uh, resources to process that trauma. And ultimately, like I said, investigate these cases to the best of our ability to get as many of these offenders off the street, because like I said, if you're a victim of someone, the overwhelming statistics are that they've attacked someone else. And the more of these offenders we can get off the street, the better it is for overall society. So, Anna, I hope that covers everything. Um, if there's anything that I missed that you, uh, no, we can come back to it later. Uh, but. 
Uh, that was great, Darren. Um, I, I love that you shared the personal anecdote. Um, you know, I was, I was gonna ask questions actually about undocumented people because there are a lot of undocumented people in our community who are always afraid of seeking assistance. Um, I'm glad that you talked about crimes other than forcible rape because um, a lot of people in our community when they are assaulted don't think that that's rape. They, they don't think a woman can rape another woman. Um, they don't think that oral sex is, forced oral sex is a crime. Um, they don't, they don't, there's, you know, a lot of people perceive rape to be a crime that men commit against women. Um, and that's, that's not always the case. Um, and that, that's, that's one of the reasons why um, people like me have a hard time reporting um, is because we think that we'll just be laughed at um, or not taken seriously, or it's not a crime or it's not a big deal. Um, so, so thank you for, for, for what you said. Um, and we'll talk more about it at the end. Thank you so much, Darren. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, okay. So up next, as Darren and Brian so, did such a great job in introducing, um, is Kenneth Elmore. Um, he's a prosecutor with the Special Victims Unit, and he's going to show us what a little bit, or talk to us a little bit about what, um, <laughs> what, <laughs> what going to court is like. <laughs> well, I, can't, I can't phrase this right. Kenneth, take it away. I will do my best. Um, okay, so just to, to piggyback a little bit on what Lieutenant Wilson and Lieutenant Aaron Rich said, um, my name is Kenneth Elmore, and I'm the director of our Special Victims Unit. I go by he, him pronouns, and I supervise a series of attorneys who specialize in a certain type of, of victimology when it comes to crime time. Uh, it's sexual assaults of victims 14 and older, intimate partner homicides, human trafficking, pandering, very bad domestics, any of those types of cases in the county will come to myself or, or one of my prosecutors. The, the goal behind that is when Steve Kunzweiler was elected, was to try to make sure that there were prosecutors who really understood what this process is like, not just from an investigative standpoint or from a law enforcement, but also from a victim standpoint, that when we have a conversation with somebody, we are trying to do it from a place of experience, at least on this side of the table, so that we can answer some of those questions and have a, a very frank and honest conversation about what could be expected. And I would say that the majority of our time is spent trying to get rid of the unknown that someone faces once they report and then once a, a report makes its way to our office. Because the not knowing, the uncertainty of what's out there, what comes next is, is terrifying. It's terrifying in any event, whether you're going to a doctor's office, you're reporting to a new school, you're moving into a new apartment complex, let alone if you're a victim of a violent crime that you make a report to law enforcement and then you get kind of nothing for a long period of time. And so I am very thankful and, and blessed to work with not only law enforcement investigators who are going to do their best to, to seek the truth, uh, but also work with a series of prosecutors who are going to do the same. So to distinguish a little bit of our office's role versus law enforcement is while we work with law enforcement and while you make a report uh, to a patrol officer or to a detective or online or however that is generated, eventually those reports will be gathered up and sent to, to our office. And the role of the district attorney's office is to review to see whether or not we think there's enough evidence for us to get to beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the highest legal burden that we have. And I say that because sometimes it can be a difficult decision to review, especially when it comes to these types of crimes. And so having experienced prosecutors to review these cases helps because we are able to make sure that if we are going to file charges and if we're going to move forward, that we're going to make sure that we have the best evidence that we possibly can to put our victim in the best position to, to move forward and to prevail. When I say prevail, you know, that always means getting the truth out there, letting the truth be heard in the way that presents it in the best way possible. We always tell people that, you know, as prosecutors, we're salaried employees. We don't get paid more or less based upon the outcome of a case. And that's because our job is to always try to make sure that we get the best result for the community. It's a very fine line sometimes because we're slightly different than a lot of other attorneys who you hire to represent your interests of, I hire this person to sue somebody or I hire this person to defend me from something. We work for the taxpayers, for the community. 
And so that can put us sometimes at odds with once a report is made, our job is to determine what the best outcome is going forward. And I say that because I don't, it, it's sometimes a very difficult process because once you report, there's a lot of trauma that is involved having to tell the story again. Sometimes there can be a, a delay in time from that initial report to when charges go forward. But our job is always to proceed and to pursue justice as best we can. And sometimes that puts us in a position where we can be at odds with what a victim wants. And that's part of the reason that Steve wanted to make sure that we had prosecutors who can review that, have that conversation with witnesses, with victims, and ensure that we're trying to weigh the best outcome. Uh, and so sometimes that means pursuing charges if a victim doesn't want to participate, because that's our job. And one of the things that we always make sure is abundantly clear is that if you are a victim of a crime, that you are protected by the law, that you cannot be forced or compelled to come in to testify. And we think that's important because we want to make sure that when we talk to people, they know that so they feel empowered. Not only that, if they're coming forward, that it's a decision that they're making to pursue something, but also so they feel empowered to trust us, to tell us what's going on. A conversation we have with people when they come in is to try to be as realistic as we can with, we understand this is difficult. We understand if it's domestic, that it's somebody that you know, that there's going to be history there that it's not an easy thing to just report, that that history you have with that person doesn't go away. With a sexual assault, it's realizing that there's a lot of trauma, a lot of sometimes self-blame that goes along with it, where people try to minimize the trauma they've endured, try to justify it away. And that sometimes it's just difficult, it's embarrassing, it's things you don't want to admit are still there. And we always want to make sure that when we talk to somebody, they know if it gets to a point where they can't do this anymore. They have concerns. They feel comfortable with us enough to have that conversation. You've heard uh, Lieutenant Wilson and Lieutenant Ehrenrich tell you they have advocates within each of their individual units that they work with. We have two in our office as well. We have two victim witness advocates who are there to not only help guide witnesses through the process, but they're there to ensure that a victim's rights are going to be protected and they're going to have access to all the resources that they possibly can. And I, I hope one thing that will be taken away from all these various interactions is that the perception sometimes of what law enforcement is, or and sometimes, I guess, hopefully the, the smaller instances can be, is not the reality of what we're trying to do as professionals, which is regardless of whether you are undocumented, regardless of your profession, regardless of how you identify, our job is to ensure that you are protected is to ensure that if you are being victimized or, or violated or, or preyed upon in whatever form or fashion, that you have the full protection that the law affords. And that's something that, and, and working with, with both of the lieutenants here and their detectives, that it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, the amount of, I mean, serial rapes that we've had, where they've been homeless, where they've been prostitutes, where they've tried to use that you know, to their advantage of saying, no one's going to believe you because of what you did. No one's going to believe you because of your job. And that's not the case. That's not the case with law enforcement. That's not the case with the prosecutors. And it's not the case with the juries. Because I can tell you, when we presented those cases, we've had very good results. And a, a lot of what we see sometimes is, is preying upon somebody who doesn't feel that they'll be believed or that it'll be accepted. And especially when it comes to sexual assaults, it's it can be a very traumatizing experience. And we know that there's always that self-blame that is unfortunately natural to have this, well, what did I do? Why did I put myself in that situation? And a lot of what we try to do is help them understand that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you identify or what you're doing. You have a right to be protected. You have a right to the sanctity of your own body. And so a lot of what we try to do is make sure they're aware of that. When you talk to people, regardless who they are, at a certain point, there gets to be this cost of doing business when it comes to sexual assaults. Oh, he just grabbed my butt. Oh, he just pressed himself against me. He just stuck his hand down my shorts. Regardless of, of your gender, regardless of your sexuality, it's just the thing that you kind of slough off. But unfortunately, everyone who's experienced some version of that knows that it's, it's gross, right? It's, it's disgusting. And it's something that builds up over time. And what we try to make sure they know is the law doesn't see it that way. It's not a boys will be boys. It's not a cost of doing business. It's not a, well, I went to a bar. What did, I, what did you expect? Because, well, 
that can sometimes be some person's very gross opinion of how it works. It's not the way that the law works. It's not the way that we work. And we try to make sure that they understand that. Doesn't mean we can file every case that comes across our desk. And a lot of times how we file things, we do take into account what a victim wants. And we may disagree. It may be something where in our eyes, justice is something that requires harsher punishment or sometimes lesser. But we're always going to take that into account. There's been a number of of persons that I've talked to who've had life experiences after, even after a charge has been filed, a lady was diagnosed with cancer, another lady's sons were being deployed uh, to Afghanistan, about to move away and start college. And eventually they get to a point where they just want to take a moment to reflect and say, I want to try to move on and move past this. And we take that into account. It can change how we view and what we do with a case. Because ultimately, again, what we want is for people to be safe and for there to be justice. So hopefully that gives a, a brief, very long-winded, I'm an attorney, it's my fault, I'm sorry. But I want you to understand where we come from with how we approach these cases. Uh, we try to make sure that, you know, if we're going to decline a case, that if we can, we try to set up a meeting or a chance to talk with somebody to tell them why. It's where they can have a face-to-face -face conversation. We can't always accommodate that, but we try to do our best because we understand that, again, there's that unknowing factor. So with that being said, to explain a little bit of what the process is after you report to a police officer, if they're taken into custody or whether it's months, years, days, weeks, whatever it is after the fact, you know, if police believe that there is you know, probable cause, they're gonna send it over to our office. Myself and one of the other two prosecutors I work with will review it. Sometimes we have to ask for follow-up investigation. Sometimes there may be other reports that are pending that we wanna look at. Sometimes we can approve the charges and sometimes we decline them for a variety of reasons. Um, but if charges are approved, what happens next is if the person is not already in custody, a warrant's gonna go out for their arrest. How long it takes them to get picked up depends on our variety of factors. And I say that because sometimes it can be very frustrating that there can be a warrant that can be outstanding for a couple of months even before somebody gets picked up. After they're arrested, they go through something called arraignment. <clears throat> and at arraignment is where they're gonna plead not guilty almost 99.9% .9 of the time. So they're gonna get a lawyer and it's gonna get set for it. Uh, something called a preliminary hearing if it's a felony. So that prelim is gonna be even a month out sometimes to two months from that first arraignment date. So even if somebody's arrested, you know, when the event happens, you're probably still talking about a two month window before they're set for a hearing and before there's a chance for a prosecutor to sit down to talk to you about what you can expect to go forward. A preliminary hearing is a hearing where there's a judge, a court reporter, the defendant, defense attorney, that's usually about it. And what we're trying to establish there is just probable cause basically that the person probably committed the crime. It's not a full-blown jury trial. There's usually not a whole lot of people in attendance, but that's the first hearing where there's going to be testimony. After that, if we get, if we prove the judge that probably did it, it's going to go in front of the trial judge. From there, there'll be some motions filed, and then they could possibly get set out for a jury trial. All this is what we try to make sure people understand when they come in, is that it can seem like a long process. Uh, from the moment a crime happens first, if it goes to a jury trial, I believe the quickest I've had is nine months. And I'd say about the average sometimes can be a year to even later. But what we try to do is make sure that the victims in the case are informed of what's going on and that they know that while it may be a long process, we're only going to ask them to be there three or four times at most. And that's usually to prep and to testify for both the preliminary hearing and the jury trial. So we try to make this to where we are aware that it is a burdensome, it's a scary process, but we try to disrupt the lives of the people that we deal with as little as we possibly can. We always make ourselves available. Uh, if someone has a question, we'll make sure they have time to, to come in to talk to us, uh, but it's not gonna be something to where we're gonna constantly be dragging them down to, to talk to us more if that's something that we can avoid. So that's kind of what the process can look like. Uh, when you come in, you'll meet with the prosecutor and the advocate will be there. They'll go over some of the facts. We try to answer questions as best as we can as far as what you might um, be asked by us, what you might be asked by defense attorneys, and, and give an overview of what we think is going to happen. What we always tell people when we meet is that the only thing we ever care about and the only thing we're ever going to ask any witness to do is just to tell the truth. 
good, bad, ugly, in between, as long as you're telling the truth, as long as you are as honest as you can be when asked a question, is that the process is far less scary and it's far less traumatizing at a certain point because there's no right or wrong way to answer a question, so long as you're telling the truth, whether it comes from an incident with somebody you know, somebody you didn't know, whether there's drugs or drinking involved, where things get murky, where they can go kind of haywire is whenever somebody gets embarrassed or they don't stick to that truth. And so that's what we always tell them when they come in. All you ever have to do when you're asked a question is just to tell the truth. And if you do that, it's going to go a lot easier. Again, a big point for us is making sure they know that we're going to have these conversations. And when they talk to a prosecutor, it's going to be someone who specializes in these types of cases. Uh, we sometimes have to have very frank conversations. Sometimes they can be graphic conversations, but that's the nature of what we do. And it's not something that is ever fun or easy, but we try to tell people just like when you go to the doctor and you got to have a very frank conversation about what hurts or, or what's not feeling right. It's the same when you come to talk to us. So um, one of the things that I think also can be difficult is, especially with people who are struggling with their their gender struggling with their sexuality is a belief that they're not going to be believed by their prosecutors by law enforcement uh, or whatever it may be that it's going to be something that is going to be laughed off or something that is going to be not taken seriously. And I can tell you that that's never been my experience. We've prosecuted across the board numerous cases to where there have been people from same sex or transgender, whatever it is, whatever they're at whatever their role is and whatever function in life, if they're victimized, we're going to believe them and we're going to prosecute a case on their behalf. Um, one of the other cases that we see sometimes is also going to be knowingly exposing somebody to, to HIV, which is a, a, a separate sect of some of the crimes. They're also uh, knowingly exposing others to infectious disease. And those types of crimes are basically both not to prosecute somebody or not to criminalize the act of engaging in behavior if you have these diagnoses. It's prosecuting somebody for failing to, to take away the other person's choice by not telling them, by not letting them make an informed decision. And I know there are, are I believe, a couple of open cases right now that Lieutenant Aaron Rich's uh, detectives have worked very hard on that we are working hard to prosecute. When it comes to, to sexual assaults, a lot of times we try our best to keep up with what it is and how it kind of falls under a very, I guess, archaic reading of the law sometimes. When we talk about oral sex, the way it's filed under the statutes is forcible sodomy, which is something most people might not think of when it comes to touching somebody inappropriately. That's going to fall under sexual battery. And that can be in a variety of different ways that the way the law is written is trying to give enough breadth to allow people to focus on victimizing somebody. So we do our best to, to fall within those guidelines. Um, things like indecent exposure are something to where, again, you're taking away that person's choice if you're preying upon or you're targeting them and you're showing them stuff they have no business or no desire to see. Uh, things like the Peeping Tom case that Lieutenant Aaron Rich talked about, people hiding cameras, people taking upskirts, things of that sort are, again, victimizing someone and taking away their right and their ability to make a choice are things that we're going to take very seriously and we're going to prosecute. Um, we always tell people when they come in that we can never promise you an outcome because we tell you we're never going to lie to you. That when you come in, you're always going to get an honest answer about what happened because that's our goal and that's our job. What we want to do is try to empower them as much to feel they can be honest and understand that there are going to be people out there to try to not only protect you, but also to help fight for you. And that's what I'm very lucky to work with a team of prosecutors and a series of detectives who do that. So that's a very long winded explanation. Uh, I could probably keep going, but I don't think anybody needs to hear my voice anymore. So, I think it was great, you know? Kenneth. Um, thank you so much. Um, so a couple of things that you said that I really liked. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you explained the process. I think that the timing of it is something that people are very apprehensive about. Like, why do I even bother if it's gonna take so long? Um, but I liked how you said that like, you're there every step, you're not gonna bug them if they don't want to, and that no one is, is, can be forced to testify. And that no one, will be test, test, no one can testify if they don't want to. 
Um, and I, I, I'm, I really liked that. Um, I like that you gave the different descriptions of like, what is sexual battery? Um, what is, what uh, forcible sodomy was? Because those are a lot of things. Like if I was raped by a woman, would that still be considered rape? Um, so that's, that's something that I've constantly wondered. Um, so really thank you for that. Um, uh, before we go to our second half of the program where I wanna talk to our representatives from DBIS um, which stands for Domestic Violence Intervention Services, um, to kind of talk about like the process. If you if you don't want to talk to law enforcement, what resources are still out there? Before we do that, I want to jump back to Brian Wilson because having this conversation with Kenneth reminded me, and I want to connect it back to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, reminded me of a story that he told me when we first met, um, and. I, I I was really shaken by that story and I was really, really, um, it was really heartwarming and heartwarming is the wrong word. It was really important to me to know that, that this guy, this guy from OU in this, in this cowboy hat or not cowboy hat in this, in this baseball cap is out there looking out for people like me. So um, I'm going to let Brian take over now and tell us um, a little bit of how how, he, how this unit um, has specifically served the LGBTQ plus community. So. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so glad you asked the question and brought me back because like I said, listening to uh, Kenny and Darren talk, uh, it reminded me, I, I didn't even do a good job really explaining what human trafficking is as a crime. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, so human trafficking is basically anytime somebody forces somebody to do something, uh, by force, fraud, or coercion. So they get them to do something by force, fraud, or coercion. And that can be, um, so for instance, labor trafficking. Uh, we work multiple, multiple labor trafficking cases every year, which is typically uh, undocumented citizens here in the U.S. that come to the United States for a better life. They get sucked into an environment that is just absolutely awful. Their documents are taken away from them. They're forced to work ungodly long hours. They don't get paid. They have no opportunity. They can't leave. They can't go back home. And basically life is just a living hell for them. Um, we get those cases, uh, we investigate them, we pass them over to Kenny, uh, we pass them over to the Fed side sometimes, um, and, and we see successful prosecutions working those. That's labor trafficking. Uh, and then we come over to the sex trafficking side uh, which is where we really get involved with people who are either uh, forced into the commercial sex industry against their will or coerced into the commercial sex industry by somebody else who is pumping them full of drugs, who is forcing them to do it, taking all their money. Uh, think about your um, Hollywood, which I hate Hollywood, but the Hollywood style pimp who is forcing a woman to do something, taking all of her money, beating the snot out of her, uh, and I, I use her because typically those are the individuals that we're running across. Um, that's when we start getting into human trafficking. Human trafficking is one of the most difficult types of cases to investigate. And particularly Kenny could talk about prosecuting. Um, this may sound vulgar, but murders are easier to investigate and prosecute than human trafficking is simply because they're complicated. The elements of the crime that we have to meet, uh, are very steep and very difficult. Um, and as Lieutenant Aaron Riss did a great job of, of talking about the trauma that people feel from sexual assault and someone who's a victim of commercial sex trafficking has all of those sexual assaults, has all of the violence that is committed against them, um, but they're in a stigmatized uh, group of people. They don't feel like they can come forward. They've got trauma. Um, it's very difficult for them. It's very brave of them to cooperate um, and to see things through to, to, to prosecution, to, to even some of them go forward and testify. It's very brave. Um, and, and I use that word on purpose because mm -hmm. I don't know some of the victims that we've had that have gone forward and testified if I have the bravery within me to go do what they've done. It's very tough, it's very difficult. So kind of to come back to Anna's question. So yeah, um, one, one of the big reasons that we, we reached out uh, to Anna and folks at the Equality Center to talk was because in our experience, what we're seeing and what we're finding and talking to people across the country, it's a national trend, uh, 
members of the LGBT community um, who are commercial sex workers experience a higher rate of violence and of sexual assault than do the uh, cis membered um, people in that working community. Um, so if you are a, a, a gay commercial sex worker, the likelihood that you're gonna be sexually assaulted, just physically assaulted, or that you're gonna get taken advantage of and somebody's gonna take control of you and your money and control your life as a pimp or as a panderer is much, much higher uh, than somebody in the cis community. And it's wrong, it's awful, but we see it. And what we find is, of course, most folks don't wanna to talk to us right, right at the start. But unfortunately, um, members of the LGBT community are even more so apprehensive to talk to us. Um, I, I understand it. Um, that's why we wanted to reach out. We wanted to have, have a talk like this to, to, to try to maybe put faces to what's going on and maybe hear a voice answer some questions. But the particular story that Anna was talking about, we had a, we had a young gay man, uh, he was an adult, um, and I may get the story a little bit wrong, um, but he was a victim of sex trafficking, not commercial sex trafficking. He wasn't a worker in the commercial sex industry. Uh, he had a learning disability. Uh, we don't know for sure, uh, but he seemed to be um, on the autism spectrum. And he was taken in by uh, older men who uh, used him as house labor, who sexually abused him, sexually assaulted him, and then put him out and collected money for other people to come and have sex with him. He uh, leaves the house. He is actually taken to the hospital uh, for injuries. Uh, and that's where we have workers at the hospital who actually look out for and they monitor for signs of uh, sex trafficking. And they call patrol officers out. They, they took a report, they forwarded it to us. Immediately, we're on the lookout for him. I think that week alone of a, you know, 40 to 80 hour work week, depending on how, how much we're working, I think we, everybody in our unit spent over 20 hours looking for him downtown. Another agency uh, actually ended up picking him up on outstanding warrants. When we went to uh, interview him, uh, it was one of the most saddest interviews I've ever, I've ever been in. Um, he was actually very happy to uh, be in David L. Moss. He said it was the greatest amount of freedom that he's ever had. He said the mere fact that when he gets soup cans, those cans are his. Um, when he gets a bag of potato chips, those are his. And really that was the first time in his adult life because he was a young man that he had possessions of his own. And this is in Tulsa County Jail. Um, we talked to him, we interviewed him, we made plans when he got out to hook him up with services. He was released <laughs> overnight and uh, he is in the winds and we have not seen him since. And we still spend time looking for him um, and we hope to be able to come in contact with him because he is even more at risk now of being put back into that life and being re-victimized and re-traumatized and I don't want to see him be a, um, uh, to be a slave anymore. And um, that's just one example of many cases that we run into. And if, if I could say anything is, uh, we have compassion for all people. Um, and we have compassion for all victims and we really do just, just want to help. And Anna, if, if there's anything else on that that you want me to talk about, I definitely will. No, you, you, you talked so much, uh, not too much. Um, I'm really thankful for uh, you, Brian, um, sharing that. I wanted to, I just wanted to bring it home because, um, yeah, because it happens to us and it, it happens in our community. Um, and and it, it's a reality in our community. And you touched on that, um, that uh, sex workers who are LGBTQ are more likely to be assaulted. Um, Darren talked about how they are they do not care if people are sex workers. They are definitely looking to prosecute and looking to help sex workers. Um, and I know from my work that specifically trans women of color are the most likely um, to be assaulted. Um, the most like the most common people who are assaulted um, are, are assaulted more often than cis straight white counterparts. Um, and so um, and are murdered more often. So um, so it's nice to know that there are people in our community who are looking out for us. So thanks, Brian.
Oh my gosh. Okay. Now for the the better the the better part of the show. It's a rough show. Um, the 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 fun part of the show. Let's hear from the ladies. Um, so we have two wonderful representatives today from the D- Divis, um, and they are first up. We're gonna hear from Lori Gonzalez, and she is the program manager of the sexual assault department. Um, at Divis. So take it away, Lori. Thank you so much. So my preferred pronouns is to start off with are she, her, hers. And I'm going to apologize up front because my allergies are killing me and I hope I make it through this without like sneezing or something else. <laughs> um, so we do a lot of interesting and unique things at Divis. Um, so there's lots of ways for people to get involved with us. Um, first of all, people can call and get help. I mean, that's the easiest, or they could come in as a walk-in crisis. We also do outreach into the jail pre-COVID. I'm hoping we get back there pretty soon. And what's interesting is when Brian was talking, I have many, many people that I've worked with that have said being in jail was the safest they've ever felt, which is horrible to think about, but that's the reality of, of what some of our people face. Um, We also do outreach on college campuses. So let's say somebody is sexually uh, harassed on at TCC. You know, there's a a professor that is rubbing their back or trying to force them to go out on a date or they're going to flunk them, stuff like that. We are there for those issues too. So not just if you look and think about sexual assault on a continuum, um, we deal with the stuff that doesn't rise quite to the level of a crime all the way up to we're going and visiting them with Ken or when they go meet with Kenny. <laughs> so we like to get them at, at all stages. So if somebody is experiencing those things, they can reach out to us and we can meet them on campus or we can go into the jail and meet them. Um, I've met some people at the juvenile detention center that were trafficked and they met their perpetrator when they were homeless. They were homeless youth. So there's lots of opportunities for us to engage people out in the community. Um, We also do counseling and and we are trained in in a number of different counseling modalities so that we can address that trauma that, that people experience. And then we also go to SANE exams. So uh, Darren was talking about the SANE exam, and I think it's really important for people to know that that SANE exam is not horribly traumatic, okay? It's not going to be like going out for drinks with a buddy, um, obviously, but we try to make it as trauma-sensitive as possible. So we have nurses that are trained um, to be trauma-sensitive. We have advocates there. Uh, we're getting people things to drink, and we've got cookies at the at the same room, and we have teddy bears. We even have this really cool machine that heats up the blankets so people can wrap themselves up in a heated blanket. So we work really, really hard to make it a friendly environment. And just to demystify that process, when a person comes in, of course, anytime you go in and get any kind of medical thing done, you have to fill out paperwork, right? I mean, it's horrible and that's what we have to do. We have to fill out paperwork and we have to sign stuff. Then the the nurse will take a history of what occurred. And yes, there's lots of questions. There's lots of things that may feel intrusive, but really that nurse is looking to find out where there might be injuries and where there might be evidence, okay? And then after that happens, a statement is taken. Then there's the physical exam. The reality is the statement and the paperwork take a whole lot longer than that physical exam. I mean, that physical exam may only take about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe longer if there's strangulation, which is a whole other topic. I'm sure Kenny can talk about how prevalent that is. But um, the important thing too is, yes, we are collecting evidence, For me, as an advocate, the most important thing we're doing is, is we're making sure people are safe, we're addressing their needs, 
and we're giving out medication to address like the more common STIs, STDs, that kind of thing, as well as prophylactics and the morning after pill if somebody wants, okay? So there's that, that evidence collection part, and then there's the taking care of medical needs, okay? If you suspect you've been sexually assaulted, and I say suspect because sometimes people don't know. You know, we have an idea of what sexual assault is, and it's like the Lifetime Movie Network thing, and sexual assault is so much more than that. So I say, if you suspect you've been sexually assaulted, reach out, okay? Let us process it with you. You know, we have lots of people that wake up in the morning and they are like, my underwear is inside out. Uh, I don't know what happened last night, but I don't feel right. Those kind of things happen a lot. And we want to make sure that we are there to help them process through that and get them where they need to be so that they're safe. Trying to think if there's anything else. Amy's gonna talk about shelter. Uh, a lot of what we do is about supporting and, and providing safety and addressing safety. So I've even been known to go to court with clients. Um, a lot of what they're doing now for protective orders is on kind of like telehealth, except for it's called blue jeans. And, and I even have people come and sit in my office when they do uh, protective order court. So don't hesitate to reach out. We are there to help anybody who wants it. And uh, actually we get kind of bored, so please keep us busy. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Um, that was lovely. Um... I like how you how you said that if you suspect you were assaulted because they're blacking out people don't know um people don't know how is coercion a thing like i i said no but then they talked me into it or i said yes but then i didn't want it anymore and i said no afterwards and and, and sometimes it you don't want to talk about those you don't if you have those questions you don't want to come to police with them so it's nice to know that you guys are there to talk through that with people to say, hey, here's the facts, um, here's your avenues, and here's here's support. Here's here's how to get a sane exam, and and we'll be there. And and here's here's medicine in in case of something like I didn't know that I didn't know that you could get the morning after pill at um, Divis. That's awesome. Um, so thank you so much, Lori. Um, I'm sure we'll hear more from you later. Um, next up, we have Amy Hernandez. And she is the Assistant Shelter Director at Domestic Violence Intervention Services. So take it away, Amy. Yes, hi. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, like you said, I'm the Assistant Shelter Director. Before becoming the Assistant Shelter Director, I was a survivor advocate for our survivors of human trafficking. Um, Lori did an amazing job of covering some of our services. We also have emergency shelter, transitional housing. We provide advocacy, counseling, case management. We have legal support services um, and safety planning for both adults and children who have experienced domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, and or stalking. Um, and Divis has a no wrong door policy. So that means you can either walk in to the Family Safety Center, walk into our outpatient counseling office. Um, you can call us, you can even text us now. And regardless of what service you need, um, we will make sure to connect you with the correct program that can provide that service for you. And so you can walk into our outpatient office. It's in North Tulsa at Apache and Harvard. Our exact address is 3124 East Apache Street. You can go to the Family Safety Center and we have some Divis advocates and attorneys there. That is downtown at, this, um, at 600 Civic Center. You can call our 24 hour hotline. It's 918-7-HELP-ME. Uh, you don't have to speak English. Um, we have language line that can provide services for absolutely any primary language that for any survivor. And then between the hours of 8 p.m. and 1 a.m., you can text the word SAFE to 207-777. 
and you can talk to one of our advocates and safety plan um, and get connected to our services that way. Now for our survivors that are specifically seeking shelter, which is what I do, I work on the safe housing team at Divis. Um, and particularly at our emergency shelter, again, we have really a no wrong door, whether you call or you walk into our outpatient office or whether you're there getting a protective order and you realize that you have nowhere safe to go. Or if you're working with one of the lieutenants and they ask you if you have nowhere safe to go, um, we're a resource to meet that need, to meet the emergency shelter need. Um, we are an all-inclusive shelter, so we don't ask for any type of identities up front and we serve everyone regardless of their identity. That includes everyone in the LGBTQ community, um, immigrants, documented, undocumented, semi-documented, um, non-English speakers, really everyone. Something really, really cool and unique about our shelter is that we even have a kennel to provide services for dogs and for cats and for pets. So for those survivors who are really attached to their pets and not willing to leave their difficult situations because they don't wanna leave dog, cat, turtle, bird with abuser, they can go ahead and bring their little furry loved one with them um, and get services for their pets as well. Um, our primary service on the safe housing team and really all of Divis is to make sure that we provide safety and that we create an environment where a survivor can feel safe and accepted and have their basic needs met. So we provide of course, the shelter is free. Um, we provide free meals. Um, they don't have to pay for anything. They don't even really have to engage in services in order to stay at our shelter. Um, and then we have a transitional housing program that's a two-year program for also survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. Um, and that one is all-inclusive also. Uh, yeah. I think that's about all the services we provide, right, Lori? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Well, is that all you wanted to talk about today or right now? Um, yeah, we, I mean, I obviously open answering questions, but yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you so much, Amy. Um, okay, so, uh, I don't have any questions in the chat, but I do have some questions for everyone. Um, but also I want to recap what I liked about what you said. Um, I love that you gave all of the like specific places um, and like numbers and ways that you can contact Divis. In fact, I love them so much. I would love to make a graphic so I can post them on our website so that people know that here's the avenues for help. Um, it's really cool that you can just text the word safe to 207777 and someone will help you. That's amazing. I didn't know that that existed. So thank you so much um, for talking about all that. Um, I, I don't have any specific questions for you right now, except for, um, is this process any different if you're gay? Is this process any different if you're trans? Can trans women use women's shelters? Um, yeah, so basically, I see you nodding, but I think that I'm still on screen on the live. So if you, Amy, or uh, Lori could kind of answer that, is anything different if you're gay? <laughs> absolutely not. Um, everything is absolutely the same, whether you choose to disclose your gender identity, your sexual orientation, that is completely up to you. Um, in our shelter, we are all inclusive. So if a trans woman um, feels safe with cisgendered women, um, if there's no trauma around that, they will be, they will be put in the same room, um, with other women. We don't separate based on, really, we only separate based on, um, the gender you identify with and the gender that you're comfortable with. So if you're a transgender man or a cisgendered man, um, and you, wouldn't be comfortable or safe um, in a room with a transgendered woman or a cisgendered woman, then that's the real only separation that we have. We have what's called a special populations room. Um, we absolutely do not tolerate any type of homophobic statements from 
obviously our own staff, but we also don't tolerate it from our clients. We definitely message that we are all inclusive and that everybody needs to be treated with respect in our shelter um, and really in all of our departments. Um, if uh, someone doesn't want to disclose, it's not something that we're going to demand out of them and that's okay. If uh, you said that special populations part of the shelter, I just want to ask a little more about that. So if someone didn't want to share a room with like a same sex person because they felt unsafe, their partner, same sex partner assaulted them, could, would they be on that special populations? Would they have a single room? Is that something that happens? It has happened. And if that special populations room is open, then we will meet that accommodation for sure. Cool, cool. If it's not open, then we get really, really creative to make sure that we can create a space to make sure that they do feel safe. Awesome. So basically you guys just do everything you can to make sure that everyone is accepted and that everyone feels safe when they're with you. Um, that's so awesome. Okay. Um, I have one more question for Darren. Darren gave me the number of the LGBTQ plus advocate for, um, for uh, Tulsa Police Department. I think it was Darren. And I tried to get him on this panel and then I lost the email chain. Um, we, he's out of the office this week. So um, could one of you, Darren or Kenneth or Brian, talk about um, the LGBTQ advocate for, and what their job is? Um, within yeah, the I, I, yeah, I'd be happy to handle that. Um, uh, the Tulsa Police Department has a LGBTQ uh, liaison officer. His name is Captain Tom Bell. Uh, he is an outstanding human being. I've actually worked for him in the past. Um, he, if, if there are concerns among the LGBTQ, excuse me, LGBT community about police response or just having specific questions about um, questions uh, addressing your community. Um, he is always there. Uh, his email is tbell at cityoftulsa.org and he is more than happy to uh, answer any questions and be there for the community as best he can. Cool, thank you so much. Um, I still don't have any questions in the comments, I don't think. Um, but uh, do you guys have any questions for each other? Did anything come up while we were talking about this that you were like, ooh, I should have said that? I would like to say something. I always like to like wrap stuff up like this with, a, hey, it's not all on us. People in the audience can help. And so if you know somebody who's sexually assaulted, I would say the very first thing to say to them is, I'm sorry this has happened to you. How can I help? <laughs> And that should be like their number one thing to say right off the bat. And then offer support, offer to, uh, you know, go to the police with them, offer to um, go to Divis with them, offer to help them make a phone call, but just be very supportive in, in, in um, helping them get what they need and, and avoid what we call victim blaming statements. Like, were you out drinking? What were you thinking? Uh, what were you wearing? All of those things, just like get those out of your vocabulary and um, try to support causes and institutions that really um, perpetuate a healthy, a healthy environment. So that's my like, I always like to wrap up with uh, we're talking about us. These are the things that can help us get our job done. Uh, that was great. I have a little final final statement too. Um, does anybody else want to say anything before we sign off? Uh, I, I'm sure there's probably some new people that were here earlier. I just want to say that I, I know it's probably difficult um, to trust police, especially in this environment. And I think that it'd be uh, naive and disingenuous to say that there aren't historical reasons, that there are apprehensions to approaching and talking to police, especially about issues that are sensitive to you. But um, we're all here for you. Um, and as an investigator, I want you to know that even if you don't want to come forward uh, to make a report, that you have a right to have a SANE exam, have evidence forensically um, taken and stored uh, for the time when you are ready to come forward. And at that time, we'll, we'll still be here to help you. Yeah, Thank you can so I, much, Karen. Oh, go ahead, Amy. Can I add to that um, and say that 
you know, our survivors can access our DIVIS services and access our counseling and everything with or without reporting to law enforcement. Um, we will never ever report without consent. Um, especially for our undocumented survivors, oftentimes they don't want to access services in the community out of fear um, because of programs like the 287G program that we have here, um, because of close connections with immigration issues that we have here. Um, they're afraid to access services, but Divis does not report. We don't, we don't ask, we don't want that to be a barrier at all. Um, again, we want you guys to feel safe and your safety is our priority. Um, and if you do have the desire to report to law enforcement, but maybe you need a little comfort or you need a little guidance or you just need someone to sit in that room with you, then that's something that we can definitely support in. Awesome. And if I could add one last piggyback, yeah. I know we're all coming at the end. Um, I would just encourage everybody, reporting and documenting what happened, you never know when it can be very instrumental to help other people, especially when it comes to sexual assaults. Uh, you know, there's the he said, she said is what everybody throws out there. And we can, we still win those cases, but you never know when a he said, she said will become a they said. And you take it from one voice to a choir when there are other people who are willing to come forward. And I've had lots of cases where we look back through old reports. And even if somebody said, look, I don't want to participate in prosecution. I just want this documented in case this happens again. That you know, I've reached across state lines. I've reached back 30 years prior to somebody who was a victim of a sexual assault and they've helped put away people. So you making that report, you documenting it can be instrumental to helping somebody else uh, and, and to make sure that we have a good pattern of what people are doing out there. These, the people who prey upon people thrive in the shadows. And the more we can drag them in the lights, the better that we're all gonna be safer no matter who you are. So I would just encourage you and, and like Lori said, encourage your friends to report. Even if they don't think they want to testify, creating that paper trail gives law enforcement the tools sometime to chase down the right bad guys. Thank you, Kenneth. So I want to do some closing thoughts and talk about what I've learned today because I had this great panel of a bunch of really cool people who are working really hard to make sure that I'm safe and that people like me are safe. That was kind of my closing, that was the word I heard all day um, today during this panel, um, a safe victim or a safe survivor is, is the goal. Um, that's one of you said that, and then everyone kind of reiterated it, um, that, that, that the goal is to make sure that the person who is, who is not safe becomes safe, um, and is supported. And so I liked, um, and we had kind of had this, you know, report, you don't have to report and it ultimately it comes down to the person, to the survivor, and they get to make that choice. We talked about why reporting can be a very good thing because of repeat offenders, even if you don't want to testify, it can still help people who, and, and I, I mean, I used to work at a gay bar. There are people's names written all over the bathroom wall. I know that people are repeat offenders and I know that people aren't, uh, aren't, um, aren't talking about it. Um, so yeah, so, okay, let me go through my notes and tell you what I learned today. And you guys can tell me if I did wrong. Um, so I'm just gonna put this in, in how I would report sexual assault now, or, or human trafficking or sexual violence. If something happened to me, these are the steps that I could take based off of what I learned today. Um, I could call the center. I could call Oklahomans for Equality and Oklahomans for Equality could help me get connected with Divis. It could help me get connected with police. Yeah, I, Oklahomans for Equality would call Brian Wilson um, and, 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 and find support. So that's something I could do. I could, I could choose to talk to police and eventually if I didn't want to go through with pressing charges, I wouldn't have to. I could choose not to talk to police at all. Um, I could go to Divis, any place that Divis operates under, they have a no wrong door policy. Doesn't matter if it's Divis, I can walk in and they will get me the help that I need. Um, I can stay in a shelter and if I don't feel safe with the other people in that shelter because I am a non-binary person and maybe I have something, I don't, I don't want to be in that environment, I don't have to be. There's a special, there's a special populations room. Um, there is, the, Divis is committed to making sure that they are inclusive of trans people. 
is inclusive to making sure that they are inclusive of gay people. They do not ask how you identify. They do not ask your sexuality. And that's awesome. Um, I liked that. I liked how um, if I call 911, I know that a patrol officer will come out and ask me a couple questions, but that's not going to be the big one. Later, someone in plain clothes is going to come to me and talk to me. I can have my counselor with me. I can have someone from Divis like Lori with me. Um, that's kind of the picture I got today is that there's just a lot of people on my side. There's a lot of ways that I can get help. There's a lot of ways that people who are watching this, people who are like me, LGBTQ plus people can get help and can be safe from human trafficking or sexual violence or sexual assault or interpersonal violence. So that's what I learned today. Um, and I'm really thankful for all of you for, for joining me on this, this crazy emotional panel. Um, thank you for, for all that, that you taught me today. Um, thank you for being real and sharing your stories. Um, thank you for the hard work that you do. So thanks guys. Have a great day. We're gonna, we're gonna end it. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Folks. Bye. Thank you much for the time. <laughs> Appreciate the time. Thank you for putting this together, Anna. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. Bye. <laughs>